John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and gave sight to the many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in, the, in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palace. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of the women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' word, acknowledged that God's way was right, because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law reject God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We play the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sing a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by the all her children. Amen. Amen. The title of my message is God's Way is Right. So I uh, subtitled, Dealing with Disappointment with God. Has it ever seemed as though God has let you down? Has something happened that caused you to wonder where God was? Did you need an answer from him, only to be left wondering why he was silent? We learned last week that Jesus' word has power and authority over disease, even death. So Jesus has power to solve all your problems. But it seems as though God was sitting on his hands, or even not paying attention. And it's so frustrating. And it causes you to entertain a doubt. If you ever felt that way, you are not alone. The Bible tells the story of a man of God who had his doubts. And he was not just any man of God. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist. So at the time, John was in prison because he rebuked King Herod. He told Herod that the relationship he was involved in was immoral. Herod married Herodias, who was the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. So John said, in effect, this is wrong, this is sinful, this is immoral. Then Herod had John thrown into prison. So John was in prison almost a year before he was beheaded. So John, but John might have consoled himself with the thought that Jesus the Messiah had started his mission 
and would throw the tyranny of Rome. He expected Jesus to come and take him out of the prison and bring justice. Remember in chapter 3, John preached that when the Messiah comes, he'll baptize with the fire and his winnowing fork in his inner hand to clear the threshing floor. And he'll burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. So that's what he expected. But as it turned out, Jesus did not bring judgment and fire. In fact, he was, it was reported to John that Jesus was eating and drinking with the sinners and tax collectors. What a shock. I thought he would judge and sinners and burn, send everyone to hell, all sinners. In John's mind, things were not going according to the plan. Did he get this wrong somehow? Was Jesus actually the Messiah? Wasn't the Messiah supposed to establish a kingdom of righteousness and bring justice right then and there? Didn't Jesus care about John, who devoted his entire life to prepare people's hearts for the Savior? So here, John was not mistaken, but his timing was off by more than 2,000 years. When Jesus came the first time, he came to save sinners. But when he comes again, he will judge all the people with a fire. But John, but John did not know that. So how did John deal with this doubt? Look at verse 19. He sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? John turned to Jesus at a time of doubt. You know, living by faith is not easy. Sometimes circumstances in our lives do not turn out the way we, we would have wished or expected. We face difficulties, hardships, and things we cannot understand, even though we are struggling to please God. We may face misunderstandings from loved ones, ministries that don't seem to grow. You know, I'm so frustrated. Where are the students? They are sleeping. Why can't I get, get up? And financial problems, struggles with our children, struggles with our health, or maybe the health of others, struggles with our future direction, struggles with our nagging sins, and the list goes on and on. So doubt is a struggle to believe. It's something that prevents me from fully believing. So doubt is something that is a part of being a believer. Unbelievers do not have a doubt. Remember the father in Mark chapter 9, whose son was demon-possessed. He asked Jesus if he, if he could help his son. He said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. But Jesus rebuked him. If you can, everything is possible for him who believes. Then immediately the father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. But it is a very strange statement. I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. But we all understand that. We understand believing doubt or doubting belief. And the father's testimony is the testimony of all of us. I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. That is to say, I believe, but my faith is incomplete. My faith is asserted, fraught with the doubts. So doubt comes from our inability to deal with the negative circumstances when we perceive ourselves as being faithful people. I've been so faithful to God, but yet God is not answering my prayer. That's when doubt comes in. Doubt does not happen to people who are not faithful. So when we are pressed with the doubt, we learn here what to do. We should not complain about people or complain to people or complain about the church or give up. We must not focus on ourselves. 
As John turned to Jesus, so we must also honestly come to Jesus in prayer and Bible study with a question, are you the one? Receiving Jesus' answer will solve all our inner agonies. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Jesus did not answer directly John's question, but he did point out what was happening in his ministry. Jesus gives the factual evidence. He also phrased it in a way that would remind John of what the Old Testament said about the work of the Messiah. So this is what Isaiah prophesied. In Isaiah chapter 35, those redeemed by the Messiah would have their sight restored, their ears unstopped, and the lame would leap for joy. Jesus was doing exactly what the Bible said the Messiah would do. So this is how we help those who are doubting. We can never remove the doubt from anyone. We wish to give them the factual evidence and let them come out of their doubt by themselves through the evidence. So look at verse 23. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. So here is what Jesus is saying to John and in effect to anyone who is dealing with the doubt today. If you don't understand my methods, my ways, or my timing, I am asking you to trust me. When you are unable to see why I am doing what I am doing, or why I am not doing what, I, what you think you should be, I should be doing, all I am asking you to do is to follow me. In the final day, when we stand before God, we are going to realize that Jesus never sat on his hands. Those hands were nailed to the cross where he died for our sins. In that day, we'll understand why God did or did not do what we thought he should do. But until that day, he wants us to trust and follow him. So let me tell you the story of this missionary couple. So in 1800s, Dr. William James and Dr. Rosetta Showed Hall met in Korea and became a first missionary couple in Korea. So Dr. James is a Canadian. He was born in Ontario. And Dr. Rosetta is an American. A son was born to them there in Pyongyang, actually. And soon the wife became pregnant with their second. But the husband died from a typhoid fever at the age of 34, and the pregnant wife had to return to the States with a young son. So after giving birth to a daughter, she went back to Korea with her two young children to teach blind people how to read. But soon after, her young daughter, her young daughter, yeah, died at the age of three. Then she took a leave of absence to China, and there he poured out her agonies in a journal. When her husband died, it had been very painful. But still she accepted this from God as a prize to plant the gospel in Korea. But when her young daughter died, it was too much. How could God do that? when what she most wanted was to serve him. She felt that she would lose her faith. It was the most critical moment in her life. But she accepted God's way of working and went back to Pyongyang where her husband and her daughter died. She dedicated her life to serving the deaf and the blind. So she started a woman's medical school, and her son 
served as a medical missionary in Korea, opened TB hospital and pioneered TB treatments among the Korean people, TB tuberculosis. Later, the son would serve as a missionary in India. So when Dr. Rosetta Hall did not fall away at the time of personal crisis, she was blessed and became a blessing, actually great blessing, in playing the gospel in Korea. So we each have uh, had our own heartaches, struggles. But Jesus promises that we are blessed when we hold on to him in faith. So, <clears throat> so before we leave today's worship service, I pray that each of us may know and confess that Jesus is the one. He is the one who saves us from sin and death. He is the one worthy of our commitment and love and devotion. So after John's disciples left, Jesus turned his attention to the crowd. Jesus knew that there was a confusion among, about John the Baptist because he was in prison. And crowd must have been wondering, John must have, must have been not much of a prophet. How can he doubt of the Messiah? So in verse 28, so Jesus praised John the Baptist as the greatest man among born of women. So John is, Jesus is saying, he may have doubt about me, but I have no doubt about him. So in this way, Jesus validated his ministry as one of the milestones in God's redemptive history. John's ministry of repentance and baptism prepared people's hearts. John's ministry was necessary to help even the most hardened of sinners to realize their need to get right with God. Yet Jesus also said, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So actually this is true in terms of privilege. John was the greatest in the age of promise, but the least of us in the age of fulfillment is greater. We have a greater privilege because we have a full and glorious message. John never knew of Jesus' death and his glorious bodily resurrection. He never knew about the ascension into heaven and, and the, Jesus sending the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to inaugurate the church. John did not know anything about his second coming. But we know all of that. We know all the meaning of the work of Jesus Christ and the purpose of God in salvation. We know how it all ends in the glorious return of Jesus to establish his earthly messianic kingdom and then new heaven and new earth. So we have the full message, but John did not know any of that. So that's why Jesus says, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. So look at verses 29 and 30. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had, they had not been baptized by John. God is sovereign and almighty. He always accomplishes his will in his own way. However, do we acknowledge that his way is right in our lives? John had preached the repentance and the kingdom of God. His message was very harsh. He called the crowds brood of vipers and comparing them to the devil. He told them that they were nothing more than a firewood for hell unless they repented of their wicked lifestyle. But surprisingly, the tax collectors and sinners, they were not offended. They humbly accepted John's message. They saw that their lives were empty and that their lifestyles were wayward as tax collectors, cheese, thugs, and generally selfish and immoral people. They accepted the truth about themselves. So they responded 
by repenting of their sins and receiving baptism from John. Then as they heard Jesus' message, they acknowledged that God's way was right. They acknowledged that this was how God was working out his salvation plan. God's ways started with the John the Baptist ministry of repentance and baptism. And then God's way then shifted to Jesus. So God's way was to demonstrate tender compassion, mercy, and love for broken and lost sinners through Jesus Christ. Then God's way eventually would send Jesus to the cross to die, bearing all our sin, shame, and guilt. Then God's way was, was to raise Jesus from the dead. God's way was that anyone who accepts Jesus would have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So, so let's uh, acknowledge that God's way to save and give new life to sinners like us through Jesus Christ, and that is right and just. But the religious leaders refused to acknowledge that God's way was right. They rejected the child's baptism because they did not see their own need for repentance. Furthermore, they had their own expectations about what the Messiah would do for them and for their nation. They were consumed by what they thought and what they expected. They had no room in their hearts when God's way was different from their own way. So in the process, they, had, they rejected God's purpose for themselves. So we see from them that unless we acknowledge that God's way is right, we even lose God's purpose for our lives. So when Jesus looked at his own generation, especially the religious leaders, he was unhappy. He compared them to children in the marketplace playing a game. So, you know, when many young children gather to play, we inevitably hear things like, that's not fair. You are cheating, and I'm not playing anymore. It happens when some children do not accept how the game is being played. That is a childish pride. In children, this may be amusing. That's so cute, right? But it is dangerous if it is our response to God, because our life depends on our response to God. The ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus were very different. John the Baptist did not go about eating and drinking. He lived such a disciplined life that people accused him of having a demon. On the other hand, Jesus deeply involved himself in the lives of sinners, if, even drinking, eating, and drinking with them. Then people accused him of being a drunkard and a glutton. These two very different lifestyles show us how hard God tried to enter into their lives. But the problem was that many people in their childish pride refused to acknowledge that God's way was right. They had in their own mind what they wanted and expected from the Messiah. No matter how what God did, to change their mind, they refused to acknowledge. So they used whatever excuse they could find in order not to repent. But Jesus was not discouraged, for he knew the fruit of God's way would prove itself. So look at verse 35. But wisdom is proved right by all our children. God's way of salvation through repentance and Jesus' death for our sins and resurrection from the dead is God's marvelous wisdom in saving sinners. God's way of leading our lives, sometimes allowing hardship and trials, is also His great wisdom for us. Those who have repented their lives, received Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins, and have been born again, prove that God's wisdom in salvation and new life is right. The children of God, who pass through life trials with the faith in Jesus, also prove that God's wisdom is right by the fruit of their lives. So in the next passage, 
with that God's wisdom is proved right by woman who lived a sinful life. So we'll study that in the next week. So in conclusion, God's way, God always does what is right. God's way is always right. So that's what we have to acknowledge in, in whatever the circumstances, especially when you are going through trials and struggles. Whether we, serve, we have served the Lord for many years or have never made this acknowledgement. So today, let's put aside our own expectations and thoughts and accept that God's way is right and conform my way into God's way. 